Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Fraud Prevention and Awareness. I am Laura Fulton with Regions Treasury Management. Our product manager specializing in fraud prevention is Randy Wilborn, and he will be presenting on this important subject today. Randy? Good morning, and thank you, Laura, for the introduction. <clears throat> I am Randy Wilborn, uh, commercial product manager here at Regions Bank. And today we're going to be talking about fraud prevention and awareness, an introduction for clients facing fraud concerns. Before we get started, let's just review this disclaimer that we have here. The opinions expressed in the presentation are statements of the speaker's opinion, are intended only for informational purposes, and are not formal opinions of nor binding on Regions Bank, its parent company, Regions Financial Corporation, and their subsidiaries. And any representation to the contrary is expressly disclaimed. So for the next few minutes, we're gonna take some time to look at some background research that we've gathered uh, to give you an idea of how we got to where we are. We'll also look at some of the most commonly seen fraud schemes that some of our customers have reported to us and talk a little bit about how they work. We'll also talk about cyber fraud and some additional emerging fraud schemes. And then we'll take a look at some of the most commonly seen solutions that could hopefully help you prevent yourself from becoming a victim as well. So let's get started. Here on slide four, just 10 of the top breaches from 2018 that many people talked about. Now, I'm not gonna talk through each one of these, but I do wanna call out just a few of them. I'll start off with Facebook, because that's pretty much the household name for most of us. In that particular case, over 29 million users had their information impact by hackers. Uh, in that particular case, we know that some of the users' names, their preferences, and also listings of some of their friends' names uh, were taken advantage of as well. Also Google, most of us use Google on a regular basis. And in that particular breach, uh, we saw that there were users' names, job titles, email addresses, and even in some cases, the employer's names were compromised too. Not only are all of the online type businesses were impacted by some of the top breaches that we saw in 2018, but there are also some brick and mortar ones. I'll just call out Marriott Hotels. Uh, in that particular case, over 500 million travelers' information was hacked uh, from the Marriott Hotels database. And in that particular case, fraudsters got a hold to personal preferences and some credit card information. Now, there's one that's not on here that most of us probably think about from 2018, and that has to do with Equifax. Now, the crazy and scary thing about that particular one is we don't know what the fraudsters did with that information. But what we do know is that Equifax has some of our most valuable and sensitive information. For all we know, that information could show up on the dark web five months, five years, even 15 years from now that's being sold, like so much information is done on the dark web. We just don't know that yet. But I mention all these just to let you know that there are fraudsters out there and they are hacking and getting information from a variety of different kind of customers, uh, not just online companies, but brick and mortar as well. Now let's take a look, a, look, a look at some of the information we have on slide five, just from a payments fraud trend. Uh, what we have here is just a percent of organizations that actually experience attempted or actual payment fraud uh, during the year, up to 2017. The ones I want to call out here is, first of all, that blue line at the very top. That line represents attempted or actual fraud where the fraudsters use an actual paper check. You'll notice that that volume is higher than any other payment type compared to those that are seen below. That number has been pretty consistent, again, from 2011 through 2017. And most of you probably heard the same thing that I heard, that checks were going to go away. But what we're seeing is that checks are still going to be around for a while. We know that a lot of businesses still use them. And we also know that when fraudsters have their choice of which payment tool they're going to use, we know that paper check is the easiest one for them to use in order to take money from other folks' accounts. I want to call out another one as well. You'll see that orange line there. This particular one represents wire transfers. Back in 2011, that number was around 5%, but if you fast forward to 2015, 
you'll see that that number jumps to 39 or almost 50 percent in terms of fraud committed that's related to wire transfer. That percentage has been the same for 2015, 2016, 2017. Most of you are probably aware that there's business email compromise, which we'll talk about a little bit later, that has been very prevalent within the last several years. And as a result, we are seeing the fraud that's related to wire transfer be at a home all-time high. And the last one I wanted to call out is just that blue line at the very bottom. That one represents ACH credits. Again, that one has been pretty flat as well, but you did see that uh, it picked up some in 2017. That just means that commercial clients need to be aware that not only fraudsters are using fraud related to paper checks or wire transfer, but we are still seeing quite a bit of activity that's related to unauthorized ACH debits and credits as well. So the question becomes, why target commercial accounts? Well, here are a couple of answers. First of all, that's where the money is. That's where the higher balances are. You and I may have personal accounts that have a certain balance, but compared to commercial accounts or those accounts that belong to our employers, the balances are quite different. The next reason is because commercial accounts have tools that our personal accounts don't normally have. And there are tools that will let a flock to use money and move money pretty quickly, such as wire transfer or ACH tools. Those are tools that corporations usually have, and if a fraudster can get their hands on those tools, then they can use and move money real fast. And then there's one other thing that you need to remember. The computers that we use at work are rich in valuable information that could be mishandled if it's put into the hands of a fraudster. So think about the laptop that you have at your job. You may have a listing of vendors, you may have their account numbers, you may have a listing of customers, you may have their addresses, you may even have their tax ID number as part of that statement or that spreadsheet that's on your account. Well, if any of that information is into the hands of a fraudster, it can become very valuable for someone who wants to steal money from them. So that's the third reason why these fraudsters are targeting these commercial accounts. Now, the one thing that we all agree on, the best way, to prevent companies from becoming a victim of fraud is directly tied to education. Each of you should be asking yourself certain questions, and I'm not going to go through all of these that we see on slide seven, but I'll call out a few of them here. For example, are you losing revenue to fraud? Are you keeping company information private? Are your vendors legitimate? And how about are your internal control, uh, controls strong enough? All of these are the types of questions that you should be asking yourself to make sure that you're not a prime victim for fraud by a lot of the fraudsters that are out there. How about a few of the traditional fraud schemes that we've seen? Now, there's a couple of them that I'll talk about related to document protection, bookkeeper fraud, and also business email compromise. So let's start off with bookkeeper, with uh, document protection. You know, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that many years ago, a very popular scheme was called dumpster diving. And that's where fraudsters would go into the trash can of the dumpsters belonging to these different businesses and look for valuable information that could help them access their account or guess what their passwords are and user IDs or even complete a credit card application uh, so that the fraudster could access funds illegally. What we've seen here at Regions, for example, is that we normally have two different trash cans at each of our desks. One of those trash cans is for very sensitive information, and the other one is just for regular trash, maybe napkins or paper that we scribbled on, but it doesn't have any sensitive customer information. Now, the key part is that even though we have those two different trash cans at our desk, one of those is disposed of just by the regular cleaning crew, the other one is handled by an outsourced company who specializes in making sure they destroy trash the right way. So we're not saying that everyone should do that, but what we are saying is that make sure that you have a policy or a program in place that helps to protect documents and information that may lead to death belonging to your employees. <laughs> Another commonly seen fraud scheme that uh, we hear customers talk about is bookkeeper fraud. 
Now, on slide 11, we talk a little bit about what the fraud is. It normally arises from whenever there's one person who is given a lot of authority. That person may have the ability to issue payments, reconcile payments, uh, and also release payment instructions to the bank. That is a lot of power for one person to have, and of course, we strongly recommend against that. A couple of things we've seen about people who commit bookkeeper fraud, by the way, uh, we've seen that 85% of all the fraud that's uh, perpetrated is by a trusted employee, meaning that it's not just a new employee or employee who seems to be not very close to the company, but it's somebody who's usually been with the company for a very long time. We've had some customers who actually describe these employees as a member of the family because they're very trusted. We've seen cases where they would create a bogus account and pay themselves over and over for years and years before they're caught. We've even seen examples where that trusted employee will create a false vendor and would submit false invoices so that the payment could be made over and over again. We've seen some cases where that trusted employee could open up an account uh, and names or open up a business that sounds just like a legitimate business. Maybe they will add an S or an I or a one to the name of a business. And when those checks come in for payment, they would take those checks and deposit them into that false business name when those funds should be coming to your company. We've also seen a couple of cases where clients leave blank checks that are signed laying around for convenience. Maybe they're going on vacation or maybe they don't like to have to stop where they're doing the signed checks from time to time. But even when those types of things happen, it makes it very easy for someone to commit bookkeeper fraud. One example that we saw was a large CPA firm uh, who was basically being used to handle all the payroll and vendor payments for a particular client. And that made the client feel pretty good, but even that CPA firm had one person who had the ability to submit payments, to approve payments, and release them to the bank. And as a result, the company who used this CPA firm had losses. So that means that not only can you have bookkeeper fraud when you are doing your payroll and paying vendors internally, but even in some cases where there's a third party who's being used to make those payments for you. So there are a couple red flags that we always like to call out when we're talking about bookkeeper fraud. For example, it could be that employee who's living beyond their means. Uh, you know, that's not to say you need to be suspicious of every employee who gets a brand new car. But a lot of times the owners or the partners or managers have an idea of what's being paid to employees. And so if there's an employee who comes up in a brand new Ferrari, and last week they were driving a Chevrolet, then you may want to just take a look and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Uh, also, financial difficulties. Uh, We've seen cases where bookkeeper fraud, when I mean, there are a couple of things that could happen to an employee, they've had financial difficulties. Uh, maybe there's been a spouse who lost a job, but it could be they've had a family emergency where medical bills uh, put an extreme hardship on that family. And as a result, they look for a way to get out of it and would think that borrowing money from the company would be an easy way out. But you know that once they do that and get away with it, people may think they can do it again and again and again, or at least that's what we've seen. We've also seen these folks who are very close to these vendors, wouldn't want anyone else to be control of who's added as a new vendor as well. And also a little vacation taken. For example, here at the bank, years ago, we used to be required to take one week of vacation, and that gives our manager, our supervisor time to quote unquote, sit at our desk and do our jobs uh, as well. We still think that's a good practice. So there are a couple of ways that you can help keep yourselves from becoming a victim of bookkeeper fraud. First of all, never assign blank checks. Uh, also, making sure that you establish dual control. And, and let me just stop here to talk a little bit about what I mean when I say dual control. You know, anybody who's using an information reporting platform, I always just call it iTreasury, uh, to manage a lot of their payments uh, for their particular company. All those information reporting platforms usually gives you the ability to have dual control. So there are usually three steps that need to take place in order to make those payments. First of all, someone has to initiate those payments. That means they're going to enter the name, first name, last name, bank account, routing number, dollar amount. They have to enter that information so they can initiate the payment. 
Then there's a step for that payment to be approved, and that's normally done by a supervisor or a manager. And then the third and final step is for that payment to be released to the bank. In other words, this is the process of you sending a request to the bank to process a payment transaction for you. There are three steps there. Dual control simply says, instead of having one person to conduct all three of those steps I just talked about, maybe have two or even three. So if that's one person who's gonna initiate the payment, have a second person, a supervisor, a manager to approve it. And then in terms of releasing that payment to the bank, you can either have that first person who did it to do it, or if you have the resources, have a third person to release it to the bank. That way you don't have one person who's in control of all three of those steps. That's also a key reason why bookkeeper fraud takes place. One person is in control of all three of those steps. Also, I want to mention that you could implement an approval process for new vendors. Uh, not only is that good for bookkeeper fraud, but that's also good because of schemes such as business email compromise. It's very easy to add a vendor, create, false invoices, and those payments will go out because people are just going to try and get their work done before end of day, before end of week. But make sure there's a process in place, make sure that employees are aware of it, and make sure that it's tested on a regular basis. So let's change gears a little bit and talk about a little bit more payments fraud, and we'll talk about business email compromise. On slide 16, we just show a screenshot of what the FBI put out not too long ago in 2018. And we know that they update this from time to time just to talk to us about the volume of people and companies that are becoming victims of bookkeeper fraud. For example, as of this printing, we know that over $12 billion had been lost as part of that scheme. So with business email compromise, even though it's tied to wire transfer, it's really about using the email system to get an employee to conduct a transaction on behalf of a fraudster. So what we saw initially with business email compromise, it was more around executive email intrusion. We saw email systems being compromised, particularly that of an executive at a company. That email would then be sent to someone, perhaps in the account payable office, or department, when they receive that email that looks like it came from executive to wire money to a certain place or to change, uh, change the wiring instructions for payment, the person that accounts payable will react pretty quickly, just like most of us do whenever we receive an email, particularly those that come from executive management. So it plays on human behavior. And that's what we saw about that one. But we saw that a lot of executives began to get smart and they started training their people and so the fraudsters weren't nearly as successful using simple executive email intrusion as they did early on. The next phase we saw was that the fraudsters began breaking into the systems that belong to some of the vendors. And in some of those cases, they would actually send an email to one of their partners and basically say that, hey, we are changing banks that we're working with. For all future payments, please send them to our new bank. Here's the routing number, here's the account number. So we saw that space begin taking place. And most recently, we start seeing email, employee email intrusion. And this one is really scary as well. In this particular case, we are seeing the fraudsters would still compromise the company's email system, but they would actually monitor the traffic between an employee and a vendor for several weeks or several months until it's time for a payment to be made. And then what would happen, the fraudster would pretty much interject an email to the employee, again, telling them that we've changed banks or we are updating our payment information. Please use the following information for sending that payment for the raw materials that you're about to purchase tomorrow. And they'll also use words like, how are your kids? How's your football team? How's your basketball team? Because those are the types of things they had seen in the previous email exchange between the employee and the legitimate vendor. So the fraudsters have gotten really smart. So there are a couple of reminders that I want to share with you when it comes to business email compromise. Uh, first of all, uh, make sure that, that built-in controls uh, exist. Uh, make sure that employees know that they should stop, question, and investigate before they send funds out for uh, wire transfer. 
And keep in mind that, you know, once a wire transfer go, it's gone. As soon as we receive that request from you to move money via wire transfer, we act on it. Uh, also, make sure that the people in your company who are initiating these wire transfers use out-of-band authentication. So if they receive an email requesting them to wire money to a vendor uh, or to an employee or to another company, they should confirm that that email is legitimate, but not through email, but maybe just walking down the hall or picking up the phone to say to that executive or to say to that manager, I'm just confirming that you want me to send $2.5 million uh, to this new account or to this vendor that you talked about. It only takes a few minutes to do that, but it's much better to ask for permission uh, than to uh, come later on and the money is already gone. And finally, we always recommend that you use forward instead of reply to an email. If you're going to reply to someone and you're actually have an exchange with the fraudster, you're simply going to reply to the fraudster. But if you're going to use forward, it's going to grab that email address that's in your address book, and when you forward that email, it's going to be going to the legitimate person that you've been doing business with at that particular company or to that manager at that company who you believe has sent you the email from the beginning. So we always recommend that you use forward instead of reply especially when you're being asked to make a payment through wire transfer or to change the payment instructions for a particular vendor. So a little bit more on business email compromise. At a high level, what we've seen these fraudsters do, we've seen them identify a target, like I said a little while ago, that they could particularly monitor them for a while. We've seen the grooming take place. Again, if they want to make sure they go after the executives, they may use Fishing, where they actually go out there, CEOs, CFOs, or those who are in power to tell someone to send a wire in a large dollar amount, and they are trying to get their information so that they can begin using their email addresses. We've seen the exchange of information as well. Again, that's where that foster could send that email uh, to the accounts payable person, and the accounts payable person is actually thinking it's coming from a legitimate vendor, and get them to send that wire, which is step four, and once that wire is sent, the fraudster would normally use a money mule or someone to transfer those funds out of their account and then to another account, which is normally outside of the country. And finally, that's related to business email compromise that we're seeing is the W-2 fraud scheme, which is normally pretty popular around tax time. In this particular case, we see the fraudsters would pretty much request someone in the accounts payable area to send them a copy of a W-2 request or a list of employees. They may, for example, say, send me a list of all the W-2s for employees who make above $100,000 or above $50,000. And once they have that in hand, then they can conduct some damage against those people. So a couple of best practices to avoid this scheme as well. Again, make sure that you're implementing dual control, like I talked about a little while ago. Provide employee training and awareness. So not only should employees realize that these types of things are going on, but make sure that they are aware of them so they can possibly spot any email that could be a suspicious email. And again, avoid replying directly to emails if it's regarding payment terms. So now let's shift gears once again and just talk a little bit about cyber fraud. Uh, the first question that we normally get from people when we're talking about cyber fraud is where are the bad guys? And what we've seen for the past five to eight years is that a lot of the folks who are creating this malware that's used to steal information or to break into an email system for a company, a lot of that malware is created in places like Russia and Ukraine and so forth. But what we've seen lately is that a lot of those have actually been created in parts of China. And most of that is because some of the information and education that has taken place have forced some of those fraudsters to move to different places. And we're starting to see more of that from China right now. So not only is that information and those malware is created there, but we know that that malware is for sale on the dark or the dark web. You know, I've seen some numbers recently that said that uh, we're actually only accessing 10% of the entire internet out there. But not too long ago, I saw something that said we're only accessing about 5%. That means that all of the rest of the World Wide Web that's out there, that 90 or 95% that we don't access, could be considered the dark web. 
Now, we use browsers such as Chrome, or Internet Explorer, and Safari, and those are the ones that only allow us to access that safe 5 or 10 percent of the Internet. Because they know that once you start going to some other sites, there's a lot of vicious malware that can get on your computer, and we don't want that to happen whenever we do a search. So the dark net is very big out there. And we know that the folks who are actually using that malware could be someone who actually lives right next door to you. So let's talk about the method of attacks, okay? Uh, so when we talk about business email compromise, you know, you should be already thinking, how in the world can these folks get information about my computer, how are they able to get control of my computer and things like that? So we talk about methods of attack. Uh, phishing emails is one of the reasons and one of the ways that we see being most common. Uh, we see spear phishing as well. Uh, in business email compromise. Uh, we also know that some of these folks use things like banner ads uh, that you may see on some of those sites. And basically what they're trying to do is trying to get you to click on some of those phishing emails or trying to get you to simply click on one of those banner ads so that they can begin adding that malware to your computer. Also on a lot of the social networking sites, uh, we've seen folks who, who get something in their direct a mail or in their inbox that would say, hey, take a look at these pictures or this video from the party last night. And they would click on that video or they'd click on those pictures, not knowing that there was a party last night. And that may begin downloading malware to their computer, unbeknownst to the user. We've also seen some emails that may go to a client that looks like it's actually from UPS. It may read, we have a package that we're going to return soon unless you contact us within 24 hours. Click here to get more information about the package. And we've seen a couple of examples where an email that looks like it came from the IRS. It may say, we have not received your quarterly tax payment. We may soon charge you with a late fee. Click here to learn more information about this delayed uh, package or this delayed payment. Again, at the end of the day, they are simply trying to get you to click on that link so that that malware can begin downloading to your computer. So we know that what they are trying to get you to do, but let's just take a look at quickly at what happens once they click on that email or click on that banner uh, that they see on that particular site. So the first thing that happens is once they click on it, the malware rootkit is installed. And guys, keep in mind that when we're talking about a rootkit, you know, it's not nearly as big as the program that's needed for the entire malware package, but if they could attach a rootkit to a picture or to a video without taking up a lot of space, that rootkit can get into the directories on your site. And then once it's there, it will basically call back to the command and control server and say, I'm here. I am inside of the computer of someone at this company go ahead and begin spending the rest of the code. Now, once that takes place and the user logs on, they may see that there's the logo for their virus protection, looks like it's still active, but in fact, it may not be. In fact, one of the things that may be happening is that their virus protection is no longer working, but that malware is being downloaded into their site. And, Sometimes what the software may do is present a message right in front of the user that says, the system is not available for the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And once that client decides to do something else instead of working at the bank or, or, or trying to log on, that gives that fraudster a chance to use the information they receive and log on pretending to be that particular client. Now, think about one of the malware that we've seen out there as a key logger. So the rootkits get there, it calls and downloads all the key logging malware into the computer. When the client goes to a website, they'll type in uh, www.abcbank.com, then they're in their username and their password. Well, key logging software will basically send all of that information to the fraudster in real time while they are typing it uh, online. Now that Fraudster will know exactly what they've used as a username. They'll know what they use as a password as well. There are some banks out there that are still using uh, key loggers, uh, I mean tokens. And those of you who may remember with a token, it has a six-digit number that changes every 60 seconds. 
And so once the foster knows what that key log or what that number is uh, for that uh, token, as long as they can get on within 60 seconds, they can log in just as the client would. And whatever rights are assigned to that client, that foster will be able to do the same thing. So think back again. When we talk about one person who has the ability to initiate a payment, to approve a payment, and to release a payment, if that particular client had all of those rights assigned to them, now the fraudster has those same rights. Now, once they get a chance to get a hold of it, if that person was able to send a wire, that money normally moves to an account that's operated by a muse. You know, these money news are folks who may answer some of those ads that they see on places like careerbuilder.com and Monster that say, you know, make $5,000 a day without leaving home or $10,000 a day without leaving home. Uh, and they tell them, you know, when we send money to your account, keep all the money except for $500 and wire the rest of them to this new account. And basically what that money mean will do is wire that money to an account that's outside of the country. So there are a couple best practices that I want to bring to your mind when we're talking about cyber protection. First of all, do control again, making sure that we're using it for wire and ACH. We also recommend that clients use email alerts. Uh, even if the person who is involved in the wire transaction or the ACH transaction is actually participating, but just want to be aware that a wire is being sent, they can be set up to receive an alert. Most banks offer those type of features. They were reconciling, which is very big. The bank is in a much better position to help prevent fraud or losses from taking place if the customer lets us know as soon as they are aware that there are checks that have hit their accounts that look to be fraudulent or a wire transfer that took place that they did not authorize. Daily reconcilement can let them know when these types of things take place. Also, secure environment. Uh, we recommend that folks who are initiating payments have dedicated PCs. And also making sure that there's very limited web surfing on those computers. For example, here at Regions, employees don't have the ability to go to a lot of different social sites, social networking sites, uh, using their job or work computer. Uh, that makes sure that they aren't getting any malware downloaded to their computer uh, and make sure that they don't become a victim as well. And we make sure we recommend that you use firewall and antivirus uh, software. And more importantly, keep it updated. Regarding passwords, alphanumeric passwords, eight digits long where they can be changed every 60 days is very important. We've seen clients who do a really good job of having those type of programs in place, but what the employees would do, they would take those alphanumeric eight digit passwords, write them on a post-it note, and attach it right to their monitor. So we recommend that not only you have a very good password program in place, but make sure that your employees execute it well. Uh, as well. And, of course, making sure that they don't click on suspicious emails. Uh, in terms of traditional check fraud, uh, just a couple things that I want you to take away from here. Most of our uh, clients who talked about they've been a uh, victim of check fraud, it's usually tied to alterations or counterfeit. In other words, the dollar amount may be changed from $100 to $1,000. Or we've seen cases where the pay name may be changed from Randy Wilborn to Randy Wilborn or John Doe, and that way they're able to cash that check. Uh, in terms of counterfeit checks, today it's so much easier to go out and buy check stock or a color printer, and it doesn't cost a whole lot of money compared to how it was, say, 10 or 15 years ago. So we know that there are fraudsters out there readily creating counterfeit checks as well. Now, in terms of check fraud prevention, just a couple of things uh, that I want to mention there. Uh, the best industry solutions that we've seen have to be positive pay. Um, here at Regions, we've got several versions of positive pay uh, that goes from reverse positive pay to next day, uh, all the way to no check positive pay. And I'm not going to talk about each one of these, but I will say that with no check positive pay, and that's one that we created within the last three or four years, and we created that one as a result of feedback coming from our commercial clients. These were clients who basically said, we do not want to receive exceptions throughout the day. Uh, we have an account that holds money. There shouldn't be any checks written against that account. And if there are any checks written against that account, we simply want the bank to return those checks. 
and that's no check positive pay. Uh, the beauty with positive pay is what makes it special is that we basically say to our clients, if you are going to write checks, please tell us the pay names, tell us the dollar amount, and tell us the check serial number. So when that check is presented to the bank for payment, we can make a comparison. And if any of those three pieces of information is changed or is different, we can notify the client and say, hey, you told us that the check was going to be $400, but when we received it, it was actually $4,000. It's just legitimate. And then we call those exceptions. And then the client can actually play a role in helping to prevent check fraud. That is positive pay. It is the most popular product that's used in the industry for helping to prevent check fraud. Just a few of the paper payment best practices. Uh, we recommend that you try and convert paper payments to electronic. In other words, use ACH uh, as much as you can instead of issuing paper checks to vendors and to paid employees. Also, make sure that you are securely storing your check stock in your deposit slips. All of those pieces, uh, all of those documents have your account numbers and your line and transit number on them. Uh, make sure you use deposit pay services as well and make sure that you educate your employee. A uh, little bit on electronic fraud payments as well. And when you hear us talking about that from an ACH perspective, we're really talking about unauthorized ACH debit to your account. So that's taking place a lot. I called that out a little while earlier. Uh, it's been a fraud scheme that's been going on for a while where they will use the ACH information that belongs to a corporate account to pay a light bill, a phone bill, or any other kind of bill. Uh, when we're talking about wire fraud, uh, the biggest thing we're talking about now is business email compromise. Again, it's not the wire transfer uh, that's actually committing the fraud, but it's a fraudster who is able to use email to get someone else to initiate a wire transfer for the benefit of the fraudster. Just a few things I wanted to call out in terms of best practices for electronic payments. Uh, as it relates to wire fraud, we've seen these before, dual control, you know, reducing the number of non-repetitive wires. If we're going to be sending a wire, it needs to be sent to the same place every time. And, and of course, if we're making any changes for payments uh, for wire transfer, making sure that we have a good process for making those changes. Uh, ACH fraud risk, you know, making sure that we're using things like debit blocks and debit filters to make sure that they are unauthorized, no unauthorized debits are uh, taking place against your account. Uh, and EFT fraud, uh, and we'll just say this about ACH Alert. Uh, this is a product that we offer here at Regents. I believe that several other banks offer something similar, but basically it lets a commercial client get notified whenever there's an ACH debit to their account. If the client receives a large number of ACH debits and they only want to be notified about a few of them, they can specify whether they, there's a start date from when a vendor could notify, uh, could debit their account. And if that vendor debits their account before that start date, the client will be notified. Also, you can do it based on a maximum dollar amount. A client may, for example, say that they only want to be notified about ACH debits that exceed $50 or $100 or $5,000 or $50. And that will keep them from being notified about every ACH debit that hits of their account. But we notify our clients by 7 o'clock a.m. on the business day about all the ACH debits that are uh, hit their account. They'll have a chance to review those, and if there are any that they want to return, they'll let us know, and we will return those debits that the client thinks may be fraudulent. So, as we wrap up, uh, for anyone at your company who did not get a chance uh, to view this webinar, and they may want to go and take a look later on, you can always go to our site at regions.com slash stop fraud to see some information that we try and provide from time to time about different fraud schemes that we see that are related to payment. Uh, they can always go to that site. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to you, Laura. Thank you, Randy. With our time left, let's go over a few frequently asked questions. Here's one. What are some of the most common passwords fraudsters expect people to use? Uh, that's a great question, uh, Laura. Uh, from what we've seen, uh, I think the most popular password that clients use is actually the word password. And uh, fraudsters know that. And, and the scary thing about this is that fraudsters also know that clients and individuals, consumers as well, may use the same password over and over again 
for different logons for different sites. So we know the word password is probably one of the most popular ones. Uh, the second one is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what we've also seen the third most popular password is actually QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T, which if you look at the top um, row of alphabets on your keyboard, a lot of people will use that as their password as well. And folks just realize this and they use it to their advantage. What can employers do to convince employees to be more vigilant and concerned about fraud and fraudsters? Uh, I think number one is the education piece, like we talked about a little while ago. Um, I think that will help employees become more vigilant. And not only do they need to be educated, but they also need to have a program in place that employees are aware. And, and third, not just having that program in place, but making sure that it's tested from time to time and that employees know they're going to be tested. So, for example, if you are concerned about employees clicking on a fraudulent email or a suspicious email, I think it's a good idea to send test emails to your employees and monitor and measure what happens as well. All right. As an industry, are banks making much progress towards shutting down fraudsters? Uh, I think that progress is being made or, uh, as it applies to the various schemes that we're seeing out there, uh, particularly since the banks are beginning to work jointly with a lot of the federal agencies out there, uh, so they're able to talk about what's happening to their particular clients, particularly if they see it in a broader context, and so that they can educate clients, kind of like what we're doing here today. The scary part is that these fraudsters are working around the clock. Most of us are working 10 and 12 hours a day, but the fraudsters are always trying to stay one step ahead of us. And by the time we've educated our clients about whatever the current fraud scheme is, fraudsters seem to be coming up with a new one. So we just ask uh, our clients to continue to educate their employees, educate each other, and continue to work closely with their bankers. All right. Well, thank you, Randy. And thanks to all who could join us today. If you have questions about fraud prevention, please contact your Treasury Management Officer or visit regions.com forward slash stop fraud.